How y'all doing? Great. Um, my name's Tom Hare, and I am a faculty member here at the Graduate School of Education, and I am a professor of practice. Uh, we have different types of faculty here. We have folks who have spent their, uh, their career uh, primarily in the academy doing research on important issues, uh, but we also have faculty here who have spent most of their career in the field, and I am one of those. Um, I started teaching here in uh, 1999, and I had been, uh, I was e pretty old even by, uh, e even then. <laughs> I, had, I was 50 years old, and I had worked in the, in the field for, for quite a while. As a teacher, a special education teacher, uh, special education, anybody special ed teachers here? <laughs> All right. Uh, special ed teacher, special ed administrator, um, and, and policy maker. I had spent uh, my life uh, so far in this, in this field and have continued to. Um, when I started teaching here, um, I um, started teaching courses on inclusive education, which I continue to do. And um, I thought I'd be teaching people who were educators, which I do, um, around how to implement inclusive education in schools. Um, but when I started teaching my classes, one of the things that I observed was I was having quite a few students in my classes who had disabilities. Now, I went to Harvard in the 80s as a doctoral student, and there were not students with disabilities here. There was one blind guy that I can remember, but there weren't students with cerebral palsy, there weren't students who were blind, there weren't students who were, uh, there was one blind guy, there weren't students who were deaf, um, there certainly weren't students who had dyslexia. Um, and so as I started teaching the class, I realized that um, I had to uh, walk my role, so to speak, and um, make sure that my classes were accessible for students with disabilities. Um, and I started to get to know um, these students as I get to know all my students, but I was really interested in how did they get to Harvard? Because if you look at some of those big studies like the Andrew does and so forth, um, the prediction uh, that a student who has a significant disability in first grade would be able to get to Harvard is very, very small, unfortunately. But having devoted my career to providing access to education uh, for students with disabilities, I was really interested in their stories. Um, and so I started, I, I started asking them the simple question, how did you get here? Now, most of the research I do is, again, using large data sets like Andrew talked about earlier, um, observational data. But sometimes qualitative methodologies gets behind what's in the quantitative data. And I wanted to get behind in a deep way with these students. And so I asked them their stories. Um, there were remarkable similarities in themes in these uh, stories of 16 students that I chose. All of these students were students who had disabilities that were identifiable by first grade. So these were, these were not on the margins. These were students who had fairly significant disabilities that were obvious by first or second grade. Most of the dyslexics, it should be obvious by first grade. Um, and so there were 16. They had different types of disabilities, um, deafness, blindness. One student was deaf and blind, um, uh, cerebral palsy, uh, dyslexia, um, uh, signif very significant uh, psychiatric disability as well. When I asked them how they got here, the first response was, my mother. Um, and it was very quick. Um, it was a reflex almost uh, when I asked them this question. And it was every one of them but one. Um, and one of, the, one of them said their dad, so the guys are not off the hook. But. <laughs> This says something about sexism, right? Um, but it was my mother. Now, that's a great story. It's an inspirational story. You know, these wonderful mothers that stepped up to the plate. But it's also a disturbing story. Because why should a kid's educational access be dependent upon extraordinary um, efforts on the part of their parents? Um, what children need should happen naturally. And for none of these students did that occur. Um, the, another thing that was really interesting about these students is by fifth grade, they had figured out what they needed to be successful in school. One of the myths that's out there about a lot of disabilities is if you get the right interventions, they go away. By and large, they don't. 
Dyslexia doesn't go away. Deafness, blindness, disabilities don't go away. But what students need to learn is strategies around how to access education. And these students, virtually all of them, had learned strategies by fifth grade. So often people don't think about teaching kids explicit strategies around their disabilities. So often educators don't even use the word disabled um, to describe what might be going on with students. Students don't often have a name for why they're struggling in school. These students did. Um, and um, at fifth grade, these kids were developmentally too young to have figured it out themselves. They figured this out th with their parents and their teachers. Um, and this was many of the strategies that these students used, they carried all the way through life um, and, and used the same strategies at Harvard that they did when they were in high school. Um, important lesson there for teachers. One of the things that struck me about this study, now I thought, being a special educator, that I'd hear stories about fabulous individualized education plans. You know, that these, these kids really had the right paperwork. Not true. Um, they hardly ever talked about their IEPs as we refer to them in the United States. Um, but one of the things that really, as I looked at the data over and over again, one of the things that really struck me was that these students were intellectuals at a young age. Too often with disabilities, and this is an ableist assumption, too often with children with disabilities, we equate that with poor academic performance. Um, and we shouldn't. Um, and, and often, as some, uh, uh, Beth Harry uh, uh, does a lot of work in the intersection of race and disability, she refers to disability as often carrying a master status. In other words, it is the most predominant thing that people see in a person is their disability. Um, and often that masks something like intellectualism. Um, and so what was interesting about these students from a very, very young age, they were constantly, constantly seeking more information. They were intellectuals, even though they had disabilities, and even though some of them had difficulty accessing intellectual material because of their disabilities. There's one guy in the story who I, I just love this story. He is a, a deaf student. Uh, he was an undergrad at Harvard when I had him at, in class. Um, when he was uh, nine years old, he got a cochlear implant. Um, and he had been in a school for the deaf. His primary language was American Sign Language. And when he got his cochlear implant, he was learning to speak uh, English um, because he really hadn't learned how to speak yet. Um, he had a speech therapist. Um, who was assigned to him, and he was mainstreamed into, in, into typical schools. Um, and the speech therapist immediately recognized this young boy's intellectualism. He was constantly asking teachers for more work when he was a young child in school. And what the speech therapist did was give him a book every week. And the next week's speech therapy session was on that book. This speech therapist that didn't look at his job as just teaching this boy how to speak, he was looking at his job more broadly around how do I get, how do I get this kid everything that everybody else gets. And he's now in law school and he still sees the same speech therapist. Um, <laughs> um, so, so much of, of, of what uh, came across in this, in this research that I was doing with these 16 students was how important educators were um, to their lives. Um, one of the students who um, is actually on the cover of the book um, has, has, was born with cerebral palsy, very significant level of cerebral palsy. Um, he really didn't learn to speak until he was about eight. Um, and he had very significant physical disabilities because of his cerebral palsy. Um, and he told a story which he actually got weepy telling this story of his, Dana will, and Noni will be happy to hear this, his early childhood teacher who used to have him do puzzles using eye movements. And she said to his parents, he is the brightest boy I have ever had. Don't let him be segregated. Make sure he goes to mainstream schools. 
Well, he's at, he went to Harvard, that's pretty mainstream. Um, <laughs> he's now at Stanford finishing his doctorate and has a degree from the London School of Economics. Um, but what was so in, 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 in Kevin's life, and with every single student I interviewed for this book, um, was that there were individual educators who made the differences in their lives. Every single student I talked to. There were individual educators who made life hell for them too, by the way, and I got those stories. But the stories that really mattered were the individual educators who saw in them the potential that they had. Um, and, these, and these students revered them. One student in the book who um, was uh, uh, a, a young, uh, low-income student, went to inner-city schools, um, and was, uh, uh, had really a difficult upbringing, um, could not learn to read, a classic dyslexic. Uh, in fourth grade, he was finally referred to special ed, and he, and he got a terrific special education teacher who taught him how to read but also taught him that he could do anything he wanted to do. And he spoke about her, and again, just like Kevin, got a little weepy. And for him, he went to an inner city school, and he talked about how his school had a terrible reputation, but he met teachers in that school who made all the difference in, this, in, in the world for him. So no matter what you do in the future, think about this relationship. You know, as, as I enter, my fifth decade um, in this field, um, one of the things that has been most sustaining for me has been these relationships with families and with individual children um, that have endured over decades. And all of us are capable of making those relationships, whether we're a principal, uh, whether we're a teacher, whether we're a central office administrator. These relationships were central to the success of these students. So I hope you have a wonderful year. I hope I see some of you in class. Um, everybody gets into my class, so it's inclusive. <laughs> um, <laughs> just like Harvard University, welcome. <laughs>